In chapter 4, I'm going to go much deeper into the whole issue of apparent contradictions. And you need to know this is one of the more difficult chapters in the book. And I'm going to say some things that you probably are going to be uncomfortable with. I'm uncomfortable with them too. But if I don't hold to these conclusions, and the only other conclusion that was available to me is that there's an insuperable number of contradictions in the Bible, especially in the Gospels. And I don't want to say that. So with that as forewarning, uh, let's look at some of these things that we're going to discuss. One, again, some of these apparent contradictions are pretty easy to process, especially if you believe that Jesus did most of his speaking in Aramaic. Our Bibles are all in Greek. And so there already is a whole stage of translation from Aramaic into Greek that accounts for a lot of the little differences uh, that exist among the Gospels. But there are some other apparent contradictions that are much more difficult to deal with. But to get to some of the more difficult issues, one of them is that the Gospel writers appear to want to help their readers understand the message. You know the story of the paralytic who's let down through the roof by his friends? In the account in Mark, it says they dug through the roof. Well, because there's sawed roofs in Palestine. But along comes Luke. He's writing for a Gentile audience. They don't have sawed roofs. They have roofs with tiles. And so Luke actually says they removed the tiles and let them down through it. Now, that's what the Greek word actually says. And either it's an error or you have to understand that Luke is taking a little bit of liberty to help his readers understand what the basic message is. But it even gets more difficult than this when you realize that ancient writing standards allowed a degree of flexibility that modern writing standards don't. In other words, authors in the ancient world were given more flexibility to summarize, to paraphrase, to compress two events into one, those kinds of things in order to tell their story. They were not seen as errors, it's just that was how things were written. And this is uncomfortable for a modern reader. But Jesus curses the fig tree. Does it die right away, or do they see that it's dead the next day? Did the writer compress two events into one, or you can explain it some other way? Uh, the story of Jairus is, is a very, very difficult story. The father comes to Jesus and he says, help my daughter. And in one gospel it says she's almost dead, and the other gospel it says she has died. Well, which one is it? There's a lot of difference in our culture between almost dead and dead. In that ancient world, they allowed them to compress the story. She was as good as dead. He knew that she was going to die. And there's a, there's a compression that happens in the storytelling that they did not see as misleading or wrong. Again, this is one of those things that's uncomfortable for modern readers, but it's something that you're going to have to struggle with. And finally, in this chapter, I also am going to be talking about miracles. I talked about this earlier, and I said, you know, some people say there are no miracles. So obviously, this can't be what was originally written. And all that I'm stressing at this point is that either you believe that there are miracles or you believe that there can't be miracles, but both are positions of faith. And our position of believing that God can intervene in the course of nature and how things generally happen and make water so hard that his son can walk on him or heal the blind or heal the deaf, we don't see those as impossible. We see them as miracles. That's our faith position. Other people have faith positions that say that can't happen. Both are faith positions. Our position is not necessarily wrong.